So um, if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Romans chapter 9. We're going to pick up in verse 6. The title of today's message is The Unfailing Word of God. Um, So I'm just going to go straight into the scripture uh, real quick uh, after I pray. Father, I pray over this word. God, I thank you that it does not return void. God, I thank you that you want us to capture your word into our hearts. So today, Lord, I pray that your, your word would speak to each and every one of us, that not one person would leave here not having felt your presence or, or your touch in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Okay, Romans 9, picking up verse 6, says, But it's not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who have descended from Israel be, belong to Israel. And not all are children of Abraham because... They are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise who are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said. About this time next year, I will return, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah was conceiving children by one man, our forefather Isaac Though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election could, might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told, the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then, it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed on all the earth. So then, he has mercy on whom he wills, and he hardens whom he wills. So as I began to study Romans chapter 9, um, I, I honestly began to get a little overwhelmed. I mean, just, just, just if, I'm, if I'm honest about it. Um, uh, during my sabbatical, Pastor Rustin and Pastor David, they got to preach through Romans chapter 8, which is chocked full of just amazing scripture. Like some of Paul's greatest writing is in Romans chapter 8. And then I come back and I'm like, I got Romans 9. And uh, I'm gonna, I'm, this is going to be great. And I get in there, I'm like, huh? Where are you going here, Paul? I'm like, what? Like, it's like, how am I going to come up with something good to go along with this? Like, how do, I, how do I preach this? So as I began to study this chapter, I learned that some scholars believe that chapters 9 through 11 were actually a side note that Paul had written and that the, the scribes just took it and smacked it in between 8 and 12. Um, that's, that's one belief and everything. And then, then you know, as, as I like, read people's commentaries, some, people, like, some people just get to this part of, the, of, of Scripture and they just write a question mark and they move on to 12. Because it's like, what, I don't know where Paul was going here, why, why he went there. But I, as I look at it, I tend to disagree with that thought. Um, and, and I understand that there, there's a purpose to why Paul wrote everything he wrote. Because the Word of God, the Bible tells us that the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and of the spirit, of the joints and of the marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It also says, all Scripture is God-breathed, or breathed out by God, and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. So if Paul wrote it, the Holy Spirit inspired it. Therefore, it means something, it matters something to us. So what are we going to do? Uh, we're going to discover the purpose today, to, together today. And as we're going to go through this, we're going to do it how we've done all of this, this, um, this series, verse by verse, piece by piece, and allow God to speak to us through it. So um, this one's going to be a little deep today in theology, a little bit more deeper than I usually go, and, uh, and, and for some it may be uncomfortable um, as we dive into this. Um, but in chapter 9, we find Paul is helping the reader work out some questions 
that come to mind. He's, he's taught all the way through verse or chapter 8, which wasn't a chapter, all the way through the letter at this point. He's kind of taught through it and like, of this, like, it's not by, by your works. It's not by it being be, who you came from, where you came from. Like, it's, none of that matters. What matters is, is your acceptance of Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Um, it, it's, it's by the work of Christ that did it. So now he's getting into chap, chapter 9, and he's addressing some, can, some, some questions, but also working out through, through this scripture what it looks like, what he's just taught. So, um, so we get to this question of what about the Jews? What about, like, what about, about the Israelites? Like The vast majority of them had not accepted Jesus Christ as the Messiah. What about them? So, um, and Paul's like, so he starts this whole chapter out like this. He says, I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself be accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, uh, and, and from their race, according to the flesh, in Christ, whom, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. You read this and you begin to naturally wonder, what about the Jews? Uh, they were God's people. They, got, they had received God's pro- promise. They were chosen, and, and yet they didn't get it. And, and, and they don't get the reward that belonged to them as a people. So if, 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 if it didn't work out for them, how can I trust God that's going to work out for me? I mean, it's a natural question that comes to mind. It's like, well, like, they didn't get it. Like, what makes me think that I get it? But the reality is this. The first thing that we need to, to really focus in on is that God's promises are for his people. Okay? They're for his people. He says, but it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who had descended from Israel belong to Israel. And not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But Abraham was promised a son through Sarah. But. So if you go back into Genesis and you begin to look at this story of Abraham and Sarah, God promised Abraham and Sarah a son, or a son through Sarah. But Sarah couldn't have kids. They, were like, they couldn't get pregnant and everything. So they, they took it into their own hands, um, not by God's will, not by God's design. Um, Sarah decided to give her handmaiden, uh, Haggai, over to, to, to Abraham to become a second wife. Okay, no, it's, it's like we think about that and we go, multiple wives and everything. That wasn't God's plan. But they took God's plan, like, I need a son. He promises a son, I can't give you a son, so I'll give you, if I give you my, my handmaid, my, 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 uh, my slave girl, if I give her over to you, then it's like you're getting a son from me. So out of that comes Ishmael. And God's plan kind of gets kind of messed up in there. But then they, Sarah ends up having Isaac, having a son, and his name is Isaac. And then Abraham goes on after Sarah dies and has six more sons. So a total of eight sons. So this idea that like, oh, well, I'm a son of Abraham, therefore I'm a son, I, just, I, I had the promise, not everybody that was a son of Abraham was a part of the promise. The promise was through Isaac, the one who God chose. So when Paul's going here, like this idea, like, well, not, all that, not everybody that was of Israel is, is a son of the promise. It's kind of God's choosing and cho- choosing of the people. So what Paul's trying to say is just because you came from the line of Abraham does not mean that you're a child of the promise. And not all are children of Abraham because they are offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it's not the children of the flesh who are the children of the God, but the children of the promise that are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said. About this time next year, I will return and Sarah shall have a son. And God said to Abraham, 
as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarah, but you should call her name Sarah, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give her a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations, kings, a people shall come to her, come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? Shall Sarah, who is 90, bear a child? This is Genesis chapter 17. See, Abraham was laughing at God, what God was saying because he knew that there was nothing physically within them that was going to allow them to have a baby. Okay, he was 100 years old. Uh, Sarah was 90, well past well past childbearing years and everything. So in order for there to be a baby come out of there, it was going to have to be a miracle. God was going to have to perform a miracle. And the reality of it is this. It it isn't going to be because because of Sarah's ability. It isn't going to be because of, of Abraham's ability. It's going to have to be God. And here's what you need to understand. For you to come to Christ... For you to come to Christ, it took a miracle. It wasn't because you were some great person. It wasn't because you came out of some great pedigree. It wasn't because your mom, who your mama was or who your daddy was or, or, where, uh, or how, how the great things you did. It, it was because the Holy Spirit performed a miracle in your heart and you chose to turn to Christ. You you determined to to chase after him. What's going on here is a heart thing. God chose you and and brought the Holy Spirit to you. And because of that miracle inside of you, something happened and you you decided, okay, I'm I'm, I'm going to join you, Jesus. See, and then he goes in Romans 4, 19, says this. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old. And when he considered the barrenness, uh, barrenness of Sarah's womb, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he knew he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. Fully convicted that God was able to do what he promises. The thing about our faith is it tends to grow the more we trust in the promise of God. The more we trust God, the more we give God trust, uh, like the more we trust him in all areas of our lives, uh, in our family, in our finances, in all those areas, the more we trust him, the more our faith grows, the more we see him at work. See, God's promises are secured through his purpose. He's got a purpose for everything he asks us to do. He's got a purpose for everything he does. And like our finite minds aren't able to fully grasp it all the time. Like, what are you doing, God? Like, wh- what? what? Like, what? what? We, we can't fully grab it. And, and Paul's just digging into that right here. He says uh, in, in, ver- in verses 10, the nine, chapter 9, verse 10, And not only so, but also when Rebekah, who re- had re- conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. Now you're right there, like you're reading that and you're like, some of you are going like, God hated somebody? What? That, 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 that just doesn't make, make a lot of sense. Like, he, he loved Jacob, but he hated Esau. And, and, you, and you read that, and you kind of, you know, we read that in Genesis and kind of glass over it and go past it, but you really begin to look at it. Um, God didn't hate Esau. Like, God doesn't hate. As we look at the word hate, as we, like, I hate you, or I hate that, I hate this. It's not, it's not that kind of thing. Um, in the manner that we think of hate. What God is saying here is, is that like my relationship with Jacob is going to be so great. My, the, the, the relationship that we have, the, 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 how we connect to each other, how I work in him, how I talk to him, it's going to be so great that it's going to look as if I completely despise Esau. 
by choosing Jacob over Esau, um, Israel over I- Edom. It's going to look as if I hated Edom and, and, and I, because of the relationship I have with Israel. This is the same thing. Um, uh, so as we look at it, why did he pick Jacob? Was it because Jacob was more holy? Was it because he was a better pick? Um, no, he says flat out, he says, though they're not born and had done nothing either good or bad, but in order that God's purpose of election might come, not because of works, but because of him who calls. See, what God was doing was circumnavigating all social systems, all common practices, all human ability, all hierarchy um, in instituting his plan. He was electing. I, he was choosing. I'm going to choose how this goes. You're not going to choose. You're not going to have control over this. You're not going to be able to mess it up because I'm directing my purpose. Um, you see, God knows our hearts. Before we do right or wrong, he knows the direction we are going to go before we choose it or go it. See, God has been putting people in the right places and time throughout history to orchestrate his purpose. I'm going to move things around. I'm going to to put this person here. I'm going to put this there. He's been putting people in your life, like orchestrating things in, within your life so that you would come to find him and know him and everything. And, and sometimes that doesn't seem like for our minds like right and everything. It's like, it's not fair that Esau got overlooked. It's not fair that, that Esau lost his birthright and that Jacob, like Jacob was a turd. I mean, you really think about it. I mean, he cheated his brother out of his birthright. And, and, and like, he, he, like you read the scriptures and Jacob lied and he, he swindled. He was like a he was like, he was a swindler. It wasn't because of anything he could do or anything. It was because God called and God elected. And so um, his purpose was in, in choosing Lake, in Jacob wasn't to exclude Esau from knowing him or loving him. God didn't uh, reject Esau's eternal salvation. He was simply choosing Jacob to lead the nation. What Paul's saying here is God's word didn't fail. The Jews just misunderstood it. He didn't elect them just to be, uh, just to follow a bunch of laws, to, to keep with the rituals, to have this family and community ties. Um, they had settled on enjoying the benefits and promises rather than fulfilling their role in God's plan, plan, role, their role to share God's plan and promises with the world. See, they were so, like, they were so, so busy excluding everybody else because no one else could, was doing what they were doing that they weren't passing on the promise of God. Doesn't that sound like a bunch of Christians we know? Man, I'm living right. I'm doing everything right and everything. I'm, out, I'm, I'm, I'm not taking part in the world and everything, so I'm not of this world, I'm not going to have anything to do with this world and everything. Some of, some of us have that same misconception. I got saved. I'm going to just roll with all my Christian friend, family and friends and everything and just exclude everybody else, and I'm just going to look down on the world instead of sharing God's promises with the world. We're too busy looking down our noses. See, you were elected on purpose. You were called out of darkness for a purpose. And that purpose isn't just a warm church seat. That purpose is is so much greater than what you possibly can imagine. He chose you for a purpose. And then he goes on in 14, says, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? I mean, this is where the, that's not fair comes in. You know, and, and I could have gone way deep into this predestined thing um, because there's a whole bunch of scriptures on predestination and everything, which would kind of gives you the idea that, that God uh, like chooses who's going to be saved. I, I believe he knows who's going to be saved. I believe he sets apart people to be saved. I, I, but you can kind of go in there and there's all doctrines and everything that goes on there. And I could have gone all in the side notes and it really gets into that like, 
What do you mean? That's not fair. God, God, God elects people. God chooses people, but he chooses some not to choose. I mean, that's not fair. And I like, said, they're like, like, that's the word of our, our society right now. I mean, I, like, nothing makes me want to smack a kid more. There's not anything on this world that makes me want to smack a kid more than when I hear, that's not fair. Life's not fair. But, I, I, that, but that is like, that's where we go. Now. It's like, you see somebody get something, something happens. That's not fair. Why well, they get that and I don't get that. And what you're, not, you're, what you're saying is that that's not it's, not, it's not that it's not fair. It's that you didn't get it and they did. Like you're jealous, you're coveting and everything. But, but really this idea, like when we look at Ishmael and Isaac and Jacob and all this thing, is like this like, man, um, is God not fair? Is, is, is there injustice on God's part? By no means. What we have to figure out is it's not about what's fair. It's not about what I deserve. And so many are like, I deserve better than this. I deserve a raise. I deserve a better position at work. I deserve this. I deserve that. And then we get to that with God sometimes. Like, God, I've been serving you for 20 years. And I've been doing this for 20 years. And I've been doing that for, for this long. God, I deserve to be treated with more respect. I deserve a higher position. I deserve, and, like, and the, the truth of the matter, both Isaac and Jacob are complete messes. They did really dumb stuff. They made terrible decisions. What the, but the one thing that God does over and over and over in Scripture is choose people in spite of their weaknesses, in spite of their failures, because God doesn't work in the not fair. He doesn't work in the I, what you deserve, because honestly, if we got what we deserved, if we truly, in, in God's eyes, from God's perspective, from, from, from the perspective of, of the God who is outside of time, space, and matter, the God that created all things, the God who ordered all things, the God who's bringing, makes oxygen so that we can breathe it and, and, and holds all things together, if it really is, is about what, like, like what, from his perspective, what we deserve, we deserve to be like completely pushed aside by him. We don't deserve to breathe. It's called grace, folks. None of us are getting, none of us on this planet are getting what we deserve. None of us deserve God's mercy because it's not about fair. It's not about what we deserve. It's about mercy. And God's promises are experienced because of his mercy, and only because of his mercy. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So that it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. God chose you out of mercy, just like he chose the Jews out of mercy. It's not about trying. It's not about achieving. See, this is tough stuff to grab a hold of. But that's exactly why he is God and we are not. You know, I, 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 there's some, some professing faiths out there that, that believe that, um, that if you walk close enough to God that God was once a man and that he was so good of a man that he got his own planet and now he's the God of this planet and that if you're good enough you get your own planet and you get to be God of that planet and everything and then and, and that's what they profess as their faith and that's what they're, they're, go, they're living for that's what they're working for that's what they're doing works for and everything I don't want to be God because I foul it up all the time just being human I can't imagine being in charge of a whole planet I mean, no, no, I don't want that. There's reasons why he's God and we're not because our finite minds can't grasp all the things that are of God. And then he goes on to explain more of God's sovereign choices. He says, for scripture says to Pharaoh, 
For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth, so that he has mercy on whom he wills, and he hardens whom he wills. And I know you're like, if, 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 you're, if you're thinking through this and everything, you mean, you know, God raised Pharaoh up so he could destroy him? No. God put Pharaoh right where he was at in that point in history, knowing how Pharaoh was going to act, knowing the choices that Pharaoh was going to make so that he could work through getting, setting the Israelites apart from any other nation so out of that nation could come Jesus. There was a purpose for it all. But he says, I have mercy on whom I, he wills, and he hardens who he wills. So God chooses who he has mercy on. And then he chooses who he will harden, which is another thing. I mean, God hardens hearts? Well, this is kind of a loophole, like, uh, like kind of a gray area. We, when we think about, about election and, and predestination, that thing's like, did God choose me or did I choose him? Yes. Yes. Well, how's that work? I don't know. We'll get to heaven. We'll ask him. Okay. How's this work? You chose me. I chose you. You know, did, did God harden Pharaoh's heart or did Pharaoh harden his heart? Well, if you look at it in, in Exodus, you see it this way. Exodus 4.21 says, for the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let people go, the people go. Okay, so God's hardened his heart. And then it says in Exodus 8, 15, but when Pharaoh saw what, uh, that there was a respite, he hardened his heart and would not listen to them as the Lord had said. So that one says, Pharaoh. so did God harden Pharaoh's heart or did Pharaoh harden Pharaoh's heart? Yes. I don't get it. You don't get it. We'll find out when we get to heaven. It's both. The simple, simple truth that we need to understand is there that there's a part, there's a, a point where God will allow your heart to be hardened. There's a point in your sinning. There's a point in your rebellion. There's a point in you going your own way that God will allow you, your heart to be hardened. And according to David Lindell, there's three ways that our hearts are hardened. One is this. God can, restrain, can remove the restraining power of common grace. What is common grace? Well, the Bible tells us that anything that is good comes from God, right? So all the time we see people who are not godly getting good things, right? We see it. there's a common grace that honestly, because of our fallen nature as human beings, we should not have anything, God should not give us anything good. Nothing good should happen in anybody's life. Yet, even those who are not saved, even those who are not following Jesus, experience good things. The Bible tells us all good things come from God. So, so that common grace that's going on, that's allowing good things to happen in spite of a fallen world, that's because God's making it happen. But what can happen that can cause our hearts to be hardened is God can remove the restraining power of common grace. Romans 1, 24. Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. They get so wrapped up in the, in the sinning that there's no good in their life anymore. It's, their hearts become hardened just because of the amount of sin in their lives. The second way that, that our hearts can be hardened is God shows his perfect righteousness through the law. Paul says it this way, but sin seized an opportunity through the commandment and produced in me all kinds of covetedness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. Sometimes, when, like for, 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 for the vast majority of us here, when our sin was, like when, when, we, when we saw our sin for what it was, when, when God revealed our sin to us, it, caused, it led us to repentance. It led us to like, I want, I want the saving power. But for some people, 
It, when, when their sin is like, when the mirror is placed in front of them and they see their sin, they get angry at God. Like, how dare you tell me I can't enjoy that? How dare you tell me I can't have that? How ca- dare you tell me who to love or how to feel? Or how dare you, God? And their hearts become hardened. And God just lets, them, lets, lets their hearts be hardened that way. The third way, and this happens in Christians more than, any, than anybody I see, God displays his mercy. God displays his mercy. We see this with Jesus and the religious leaders of his time. The Pharisees, the Sadducees. Jesus is eating with sinners, with tax collectors, with, with, with the lowest of low, and the Pharisees are just getting angry because, because because Jesus would eat with them, that God would eat with them, that God would have mercy on them. And that's why did Jesus eat with them? Why was Jesus eating with sinners? Why was he eating with tax collectors? Because God is merciful. He's a God of mercy. But sometimes our hearts get hardened because like, God, God why, why would you give them a second chance? Why, why would you love on them? And it causes a hardening of the heart. So we've got to be careful as, as, as believers that this doesn't happen in our lives. I mean, how dare that person be elevated? Why would God choose him? Why would God give, like, why is he, like, I, I've, I've gone through so much stuff. How come that person's elevated? And our hearts become hardened towards it. Become, we become angry at God because we see him bestow his mercy on somebody. And you see it happen a lot. Like, I, I, mm, if, God, if God's going to pick them, I, I don't want nothing to do with him. If God's going to use him, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. But the reality of it is this, like, like Paul's going through all this stuff that caused the Israelites to miss it. His heart breaks because they've missed it. Because they, they don't have a clue. They miss the Messiah. They miss the trueness of who God is. They got so caught up in the, that's not fair. They aren't getting what they deserve. They don't deserve to be saved. They, like, they got so caught up in that. They got so caught up in living in the promises that they weren't living in God. Living, living in, 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 in just being a part of something. They were totally miss God. And they totally missed out on what it was that made them a part of it, and it was his mercy. And the main point and that Paul wants us to understand as the worship team goes in and comes back, back up, he says this in verse 15, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. We can stay caught up in the, the, that's not fair. We can stay caught up in the I deserve. That's what the Jews did. But again, if what is fair and just in God's eyes, what, what, what's fair in his eyes for us, what we deserve according to his, what his, his how he views things, we deserve hell. We deserve eternity outside, outside of him. But because of his mercy, because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, because of his mercy, he lets us come to repentance. Romans 2, 4, God's kindness is meant to lead us to repentance. His mercy endures. Would you stand with me this morning? See, God wants to work out in all our lives justification. See, it's not your works that, that justify you. It's not your ability that justifies you. It's not your ability to do great things or to be a good person that justifies you. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that justifies us. We all come with like the same thing, laid bare. Like he justifies us. The next day, thing he wants to do is sanctify us. 
But so oftentimes we get to we get the the justification part, we get to the sanctification part, and we're like, I don't know that I want to let God deal with this thing in my life. I don't know if I want to go there. And I really like holding on to that. And that's when the hardening comes in. And we become that bitter, bitter-faced Christian that looks down on everybody because we got this argument, well, I'm justified, but but man, I'm just because we won't work on things. And we miss it. See, God didn't set us apart, He didn't elect us, He didn't pull us out of darkness for us to just bask in the glory of who he is and never do anything with it. He called us out of darkness so that we could reach others and share his promise with them. How will they know if no one preaches? How will they know if no one goes out? So I think the main thing that, 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 that we need to grasp from this this morning is this. Let's not be like them and miss it. Let's not be like the Israelites and, and, and miss the Messiah, miss the opportunity, and then have our hearts hardened and miss out on the fullness of who God is. Let us not take God's mercy for granted. Because really, if you want to be like, that's not fair, he had mercy on you. He had mercy on you. It's not about fair, it's about mercy. Father, I praise you this morning for your word. God, I pray that you would speak to each one of our our hearts this morning. God, the areas of hardness that you want to chip away at. God, the, the, the tendencies to get complacent and comfortable and forget about the relationship and start thinking more about the attributes. Oh, God, that we would be a people, be a people that doesn't take your mercy for granted, to be a people that would carry it with us, walk in it, trust in it, know that it's not about our ability or our, 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 anything about us that, that, that brings us into your glory, but God, God, it's about you carrying, through, carrying you through us. God, I praise you that you're working out lives. Right now, I pray, God, for the person who has not yet made the decision to turn their life over to you completely. God, it's not about coming to church. It's not about being here. It's about a relationship with Jesus Christ. And Lord, we thank you that your word says that if we confess with our mouth that you are Lord and that in believing our hearts that you raised Christ from the dead, that we can be saved. So God, I pray for that person right now who has not made that decision yet, has not had that conversation yet, that today would be the day they would make that decision to follow you, to believe in their hearts that you you are God, to ask you to be a part of their life, to come alongside them, and to believe that you raised Christ from the dead. God, for the believer here today that's walking in hardness, God, I pray that today you begin to chip away at that hardness. Those areas of hardness, whether it be a sin area that, that they won't release to you, God, whether it be a, a unforgiveness area that they, have, they won't release to you, God, whether it be because they've seen you have mercy on somebody and they just can't, they just can't, they can't grab a hold of that, God. Whatever that area, God, I pray that you would begin to chip away at the hardening today. God, that we would not be like Pharaoh. But God, we'd be your people, knowing, knowing that you chose us, you elected us, you called us for a purpose. God, we'd walk in praise. God, I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you on that this week? Invite your friends to the Thanksgiving meal this week. Um, don't forget to bring the stuff that you signed up for so we have enough food. But I look forward to, to seeing you. If you Don't forget about Wednesday night. Um, great stuff going on there. Look forward to seeing you there. Y'all have a great week. I love you.